Thank you, Joe. He's got immersed into his game there. Hallelujah. I want to uh, give me some time this morning. He got, he got immersed into that iPod, man. That's, he's having a big time. I've given myself about 48 minutes here. I'll probably take about 40 uh, to just talk with you. Maybe not that much. But I want to pray for you at the end, too, because there's something about the Holy Spirit I want to share with you. But I was reading over Romans 14, and as I was praying last night, and I was seeking the Lord, I felt like the Lord said, just bring a word that brings life and hope and just really good things. And so I was kind of searching through the scriptures in my heart, and uh, I came across a passage in Romans 14 that talks about, uh, in some ways it talks about priorities, but then it really defines some of those priorities for us. And so I don't know about you, but there's only so much time in the day. How many of you like running around, staying busy, but not getting anything done? No, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be focused and and intentional. When I go, I want there to be results and fruit from the activity that I do. I don't just want to be busy shuffling papers around and and running around in circles. You know, a dog chasing his tail is hilarious. But I tell you what, you know, and that dog is working really hard but getting absolutely nothing done. And so uh, I don't want to be like that. I want to be focused and intentional and achieve things and and, and obey the Lord and do what he wants me to do in in the spirit that he calls me to do it in. So let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 14. We're going to hone in on uh, verse 17. And uh, if you don't have your Bibles or your hands are full, uh, we've got the scripture there on the, on the screen behind me. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the context of this passage, and then we'll move into these four points. Holy Spirit says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so uh, what are we talking about here? We've got, we've got a passage in the entire chapter. It talks about how people are observing new moon festivals, and they're, this one day's holy, and another day's holy to this person, another day's holy to that person. Uh, you know, this person won't eat this kind of food. This person only eats vegetables. This person looks down on them because of all this kind of stuff. And Paul really brings some correction. And he, and he basically says, look, you guys are, are majoring on the minors instead of majoring on the majors. That's my paraphrase of, of the thesis of, of, of Romans 14. But it seems to me that the, the issue that Paul wants to get across to them is that the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not about all these other peripheral things. It's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So we see, you know, we see Paul bringing correction, and we see people, uh, Paul bringing focus to the people. And... Uh, it's interesting that even today in the church, how many of you have ever noticed that sometimes we can be busy, but not necessarily busy about the master's business? And uh, we want to be busy about the master's business and about the things that are a priority to him. Let's, uh, let's look at the majors here. The majors are righteousness, peace, and joy, and the Holy Spirit, or in the Holy Spirit. How many of you know... If you could, mar- and, I, and this, is, this may come across as uh, unholy or something, but if you could market the fruits of the Spirit, if you could, someone in here must be in marketing, if you could market the fruits of the Spirit, imagine how wealthy you could become. Because the false fruits of the Spirit found in sin are incredibly marketable. And, and they don't even have a website, that, you know, some of these, imagine like a cocaine. You know, there's no website to promote cocaine. There, there's no television commercial that comes on and says, hey, everybody needs to do cocaine. You know, hey, this is great. You know, th- that doesn't exist. It's, it's simply the, what it does for people draws them to it. It just, it just makes them addicted. They're compelled to get into this stuff. Well, so the Holy Spirit is the real substance of what every person is looking for. Every person wants love. Every person wants joy. Every person wants peace. These are, these, this is the pinnacle of what we want as human beings. And so in the Holy Spirit is the fullness of joy. In the Holy Spirit, in God, in the kingdom of God, are all the things we really want. And uh, so uh, we have priority. We have to make a choice. Do we believe that? You know, Jesus said, Matthew 6, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then he'll add all these things to us. So we have to decide, am I going to pursue this or am I going to pursue him? Because in him is all these things that really strum the strings 
of the human heart to cause us to be at peace with joy, filled with love, and satisfied in this life. So let's talk about these things one at a time. Let's talk about righteousness. You know, when we talk about righteousness, I believe that there's really two types of righteousness. I would call it positional and practical. And what I mean by that is there's positional righteousness. Like, you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. You're positionally, you are righteous. Now, so, so when God looks at you, he looks at you and he sees you covered in the blood of Christ. You're holy, you're pure, you're sinless, you're spotless. If you were to die, he'd say, come on into heaven, uh, you, you're, you're righteous. Now, but how many of you know people that are positionally righteous sometimes aren't perfectly, practically righteous? Y'all haven't been around very long, I see. So, can, can a Christian sin and still go to heaven? Well, I hope so. If you look at all the possibilities for sin, there's sins of commission, there's sins of omission, there's all kinds of ways someone can violate God's heart and God's will. So, if we have to be perfectly, practically righteous in every single solitary way, heaven's going to be a small place. There's not going to be a lot of people there. But I believe... Practi positional righteousness is what puts us in right standing with God. And as we walk positionally righteous before God, that positional righteousness translates into practical righteousness in our everyday lives. So what is righteousness? I'm a, I'm a child of the 80s, so, you know, righteous dude. You know, I had to throw that out there. For... All right, so righteousness is the gracious gift of God to men, whereby all who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ are brought into right relationship with God. This righteousness is unattainable by obedience to any law, or by any merit of man's own, or any other condition than that of faith in Christ. So righteousness is not anything we can earn. It is something that is uh, reckoned unto us as we believe in Christ by faith. As we trust in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. How many of you know at the cross was the best trade for humanity and the worst trade for God in human history? We, we get to go and say, you mean I get to have fellowship with God and I get to become righteous and I get eternal life? And what do you get? You get my broken life. But he did it anyway. You know, and that word that the Lord used Becky to give this morning, amazing. He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. He cares for us. He wants us to come closer, come closer to him because he cares so deeply and intimately for us. And, you know, Romans 5, 8, you know, while we were still sinners, Christ paid this incredible price for us. But, you know, how about now? Now that we're walking with God, now that we're in church, we're we're serving the Lord. We're, we're going to classes. We're teaching classes. We're, we're giving. We're supporting missionaries. Man, if he felt that way about us when we were sinners, man, he, he might even feel a little better about us now. I'm not saying he does, but he might. Amazing. Amazing love that God has for humanity and it, us individually. All right, so Abraham was considered righteous because of his faith. It was credited to him as righteousness. And I believe, according to Romans 4, 3, that our righteousness is the same way. We are made righteous. We are put into right standing with God because of faith. Because we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose from the grave, and he paid the penalty for our sin. All right, so let's talk a little bit about practical righteousness. One thing I've noticed is that people who have a sin problem that, that controls their life, it messes up their life. How many of you have ever known someone that had a sin problem that destroyed their marriage? They had, a, they had a sin problem that messed up their financial net worth. I was watching a program with my daughter on the Netflix, and it was about professional athletes that come out of college, and they, get, they sign these $368,000 signing bonuses, and they get into a 10-year contract for $50 million, and they're, they're just, oh, man! Party! I mean, they got more money, they, and all all these all this adversity around this this big financial windfall begins to destroy these. There were man after man after man who had gone through this professional career who had filed bankruptcy, who who was who was broke. You could tell by listening to them; they, they were trembling on the inside. They were broken. Their own family had betrayed them over over all these resources. Just just amazing uh, how how all that unfolded. 
But uh, practical righteousness is something that unfolds in our lives, and it changes the way we think. It changes the choices we make. It changes our attitude. Anybody ever need an attitude adjustment? <laughs> yeah. And the Holy Spirit is good at, good at giving attitude adjustments. And if we'll allow that righteousness to play out, the righteousness God reckons to us causes us to become, in Christ, all that God requires a man to be, all that he could never be in himself. This faith thus exercised brings the soul into vital union with God in Christ and, and inevitably produces righteousness of life, that is, conformity to the will of God. How many of you could raise your hand and say, Pastor Tony, this morning I am perfectly, practically righteous. I haven't sinned. I haven't sinned in thought, deed, attitude, action, sins of commission, sins of omission, in six months. Anybody raise their hand and say, that's me? Okay, well, my hand's not up either. But how many of you could raise your hand and say, you're a whole lot better than you used to be? <laughs> See what I mean? Yeah, isn't that good? So, so we're being sanctified. We're being made practically righteous by our positional righteousness. As we walk with God, his character, his essence, and his nature begins to transform us on the inside to make us new people and that bring glory to his name. Let's talk about peace. Um, I, I've seen the bumper stickers, and uh, maybe you have too. It's no Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. And it's N-O Jesus, N-O peace. K-N-O-W, Jesus. K-N-O-W, peace. Sorry. Anyway, maybe I'll come over to this side. All right, so what is peace? You, got, you guys with me back there? Yeah, hoo, hoo. All right. All right, so what's peace? That tranquil state of a soul, assured of its salvation through Christ, and so fearing nothing from God, and being content with its earthly lot of whatever sort that is. When you've got this going on, you're good. Now, I'm not saying you're perfect. I'm not saying, you know, everything's wonderful. But you're, on the inside, you're at peace. When you know that you're in right standing with God, and you're okay with where you are in life, you can chill. You can rest. You can have peace. Let's talk about peace with God. In Romans 5.1 it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when we know, when we understand Scripture that by faith we're made righteous, by faith we're justified. What does justified mean? Justified means just like you've never sinned. Just like you're clean and holy and pure, you're, you're in great standing with God because of faith in Christ. So that, that allows us to have peace with God. We can rest and know that we're okay with the Lord. Peace with God opens up the way of love and true spiritual growth. Now, the Bible says here, I think it's in 1 John 4, 18, that perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with what? Punishment. Now, how many of you, don't raise your hand, but how many of you can identify with fear of punishment from your childhood, from your, your rearing? How many of you were reared as a child? You know what I'm talking about? You've got, that, you've got that fear of punishment. And sometimes we put that image, that fatherly image maybe, even on God. And so we, we're motivated to serve God because we don't want to be uh, smitten, if you will. We don't want to be, be uh, disciplined or, or, or scourged, scourged by the Lord. You know, uh, we, we kid around sometimes about being you know, hit with lightning bolts and that kind of thing. We don't want that to happen. But the Bible says if that's our paradigm of service for the Lord, you will not be made perfect. You will not mature if that is your paradigm for how you serve God. How we serve God needs to be because He loves us. And because we know He loves us, it beckons us to come to a higher level with Him. It beckons us to a greater level of obedience. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me and serve me. Sure, you'll obey me if you love me. If you, if you love me, you'll obey me. So the one who fears is not made perfect in love. So we've got to know we have peace with God, that we're okay with God, because when we, once we settle that issue, ah, God loves me. <laughs> that's great. It's very peaceful. It, it, it creates an internal motivation that's powerful. Another thing that's akin to this is the kindness of God. See, so often we think that God is going to uh, throw down some wrath and some judgment, and uh, has he done that over time? Yeah, he has. But the Bible says here in Romans 2.4, God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. I don't know about you, but I've sinned against God. And when I go before God and I get into his manifest presence with my sin, I'm ashamed. 
I'm ashamed of what happened. I'm ashamed of what I thought. I'm ashamed of my attitude. But God still receives me. And when I come out of his manifest presence, out of that throne room of God with, my, with a, an awareness that he still loves me, he's, he's, he's received me, he's forgiven me, now my heart has turned closer to him. Now, am I perfect after that? No, but I'm better. And the heart surgery of the Lord is going on to cause me to be the person I want to be, the person he's called me to be. You know, another thing we've got to have peace with is, is not just the Lord, but it's with our lot in life. We need to be content with our lot in life. The Bible here in 1 Timothy 6.6 6 says, Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Again, this takes me back to my Netflix movie with the, the professional athletes. Their, their lives were just completely a wreck. How many of you can tell a person is, when they've got a drinking problem? It affects their countenance, it affects their behavior. Boy, these guys that you tell, man, they had drug problems, alcohol problems, all kinds of emotional issues. Uh, at one time, what we would consider on the top of the world, the top of the food chain in the, in the socioeconomic ladder, professional athletes, but it all came to nothing. You know, it came to a destruction and, and uh, amazing how many have, have, have gone through that. So if we're going to have peace, now let, let's talk a little bit about ambition. Because I personally believe it's okay to be a little ambitious. But where, where the problem is, is when your things define you. If your stuff defines you, now, you don't have the stuff. The stuff has you. See, it's okay to have stuff because we all have clothing. We all have vehicles. We all have a home of some kind. We all have stuff. Now, the question isn't how much stuff do you have. It's does the stuff have you? Because if the stuff has you, you're in dangerous territory. Because who was it? Rockefeller. They said, how, you know, how much money is enough? He said, just one more dollar. I just need one more. What, what's he saying? The stuff had him, right? I gotta have another one. I gotta have more, 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 more. It's insatiable. More money, more money. Ah, you know, because now I'm important because I have all these things. Well, you're important because Jesus died for you. That's why you're important. So now you should be free from what the stuff does for you. And uh, I could meddle a little bit here, but I, I better quit. Another way peace comes is through prayer. Uh, I love this in the Amplified Bible. I think it says, don't be anxious for anything in the NIV, but, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, make your requests made known unto God. And then the peace of God, which transcends understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ. And, and I love the fact that I can have peace and, and uh, I can pray. And I, how many of you know it's okay to be a little, what was it St. Augustine said? It's, it's, it's not a sin to have a bird fly over your head, but it is a sin to have a bird make a nest in your hair. Right? Sometimes we're going to have thoughts. Sometimes we're going to have you know, worries and we're going to fret about things. But how long does this go on before we say, hey, wait a minute, I'm going to take this to the Lord. And I'm going to release this, fret, this fretting or this worrying. And God, I need your peace. I need, I need to know that you hear me. You know what's going on. And you're going to give me wisdom on what to say or what to do. Or you're just going to sovereignly take care of it because I've given it to you. So there you go. Closing here on peace, Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Be thankful. All right, let's talk about joy. I like joy. Anybody like depression? Anybody into depression? You think, man, depression rocks. I want some of that. No way. Depression is the pits. It's, it's misery. It's, it's horrible. It's, it's difficult. It's challenging. But the Bible says that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. So, so let's talk a little bit about joy because joy is cool. Joy is neat. I mean, it's fun. Uh, it, it's a neat thing to have. It, it's to experience great pleasure or delight, a state of happiness, the emotion evoked by well-being. I came across some things last night, and I want to share a quote from a man named Jason Lang. And he says, I am very small, but I can change your life. I can make you immune to worry and strife. When you have me, you leap like a little boy, but I never come from getting the latest toy. I can cure your heart when you're feeling blue. No one can destroy me except for you. What am I? That's right, it's joy. 
How many of you have ever said, you're making me angry? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I got you now. Whoa, bring it in, baby. Yeah. Yeah, what does that mean? Well, what you're saying is, I'm giving you the power to control my feelings. You're making me angry. Right? Yeah, yeah. But here's what we really ought to say. I'm choosing to respond to what you're doing with anger. And whatever else, so other feelings you might want to throw in there. Hopefully it doesn't get too, too, too far along. I don't want to give control of my feelings to anyone else. Now, let me tell you what happens. Love will do that. When you love people, you give control of your feelings to other people. That's what love is. And it's scary. And I think we, as God's people, need to love. But I think with the love of God as our anchor, it gives us the grace to love and be harmed and still continue to love. We, we need the joy of the Lord. You know, and if you, if you think about it, I mean, who wants to be around people who are not joyful? I mean, it's, it's fun to be around people who are filled with joy. You know, you always think, oh, man, who, who am I going to call? Who am I going to hang out with? Oh, yeah, that person that's been eating lemons? No. You know, I'm going to go and hang out with a person that's fun, a person that's got this, 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 this presence, this, this manifestation of God's Spirit in their life. Because it's very attractive. How many of you have ever watched a Christian person go through a real, some real serious adversity? And they can't, they, they, how are you doing this? And, and they just come through it like a champion. And you're, wow, what? It's that, it's that anchor in Christ. It's that joy that's, that's down on the inside. Let's talk about uh, the difference between joy and happiness. You know, the, the word joy has to do with something on the inside, but happiness, by the very nature of the word, it implies that you're dependent on something happening to you. Well, if you just would do this, then I would be happy. Well, if this would happen this way, then I'd be happy. Well, if the economy would just turn around, then I'd be happy. Well, if this would happen or that would happen, then I'd be, then I'd be uh, happy. Well, there's, that's different. Now, do, do circumstances control us to some degree? I think if we're honest, yeah. I mean, nobody likes things to be hard and difficult and challenging and miserable. But at the same time, in the midst of those circumstances, we can have a joy as an anchor that's not dependent on the circumstances. And, and I, I, I like to reflect on the, the, uh, the disciples. I think it was Paul and Silas were flogged. And now, you saw the movie The Passion, probably, some of you. And the flogging that happened to Jesus was probably the most realistic de visual depiction of what really happened. Because it was, a, it was a horrible, horrible, horrible thing that would happen. And, and Paul and Silas were flogged. And then they sat in jail and they said, Hey, let's praise the Lord. Because we were considered worthy to suffer for the name of our master. Ooh, yeah, we're on the right track, baby. This is awesome. Let's sing. Now, did their back hurt? I bet it did. Now, circumstance, now, if it was, you know, let's be honest, you know, I don't know, you know, what if it was a modern-day person that didn't know the Lord? You know, I'd just be in the jail going, <laughs> ouch! <laughs> That's what I'd be doing, you know. But with the joy of the Lord in them, they had this strength to understand what was going on, and they began to praise God in the midst of this horrible, difficult circumstance, and the doors flew open. I mean, there was another manifestation of God. Amazing. So the feelings of happiness, it comes from, from what happens to a person by chance. But joy is a source of delight. It is what lies underneath all emotions. No matter what happens to a person, if joy is there, it's separate from circumstances. Joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. When our roots are connected to the Holy Spirit, we will bear his fruit. Apple trees don't have to try to bear apples. They just do. In the same way, when we're rooted in him, we'll bear his fruit. How do you know apples when they're bearing apple trees? They don't, you know, you know, ah, you know I'm going to really make an apple come out. Watch this. I got another one. Yeah, I'm working hard at it. They, that's just who they are. They're just, they, they just have their roots and the right nourishment. They're receiving life, and they're producing fruit. Now, the fruits, there are nine fruits on the tree of our lives. So it's kind of a unique fruit tree. But nevertheless, this is one of the fruits of being abiding in Christ. Now, Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you'll bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. So again, it's all about relationship. If we're abiding in Him, this isn't about works. You know, the kingdom of God is not about how we can achieve something or think through some kind of... You know, I'm, for, I'm for problem solving, don't get me wrong, but, but I mean, this is really about 
abiding in him and letting him flow through us and just be himself. And uh, just kind of like uh, God's more concerned about your availability than he is concerned about your ability. Does, really, does God really need your abilities? Yeah, that's not as much. I mean, he can use your abilities, but he's really looking for your availability. I mean, think about all the men and women of God in, in, in biblical history who were complete numbskulls that God used because they said, use me. All right, let's talk about the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is what? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So I'm a Holy Spirit guy. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I, uh, I believe that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, co-equal, co-eternal, one in essence, nature, power, action, and will with God, the Father, and Jesus the Son. You know, uh, I've been around a little while, and I've, I've heard the Holy Spirit referred to as an it before. I don't really like that. I mean, don't, don't get, you know, walk on eggshells around me. Oh, I can't talk a certain way around Pastor Tony because he's real sensitive about this. But I'm just saying the Holy Spirit's a him. He's a he. He's a person. And so I like to refer to the Holy Spirit as a person. And uh, I know I've got other brothers in the Lord that don't even like to use the word the to describe the Holy Spirit. They just want to call him by his name, Holy Spirit. You wouldn't call me the Tony Hammock, right? You just call me Tony Hammock. And so they don't even like to use the word the. Was that a preposition? I don't know. My grammar's not that great. It's been a couple years since I went through that. Article, that's it. So, uh, anyway, let's move on here. I want to talk about the Holy Spirit in the beginning of time here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The Holy Spirit appears. And the Holy Spirit's brooding over the waters. And uh, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, like I already said. And uh, he's been around since before linear time existed. He's co-eternal with God the Father and Jesus the Son. So there he is in Genesis 1, 2. I'm going to fast forward through uh, four or five, well, how many thousand years, six thousand years here, and go to Luke 24, 49. I want you to know Jesus died so you could have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a junior form of God. He is not a uh, lesser manifestation of God. Jesus said, it's good that I go. And the reason it was good that he went is because he was going to send the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is incredibly important for the life of a Christian person. Uh, here he says, uh, I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So with the Holy Spirit comes power. And I believe the Greek word there is dunamis, which is where we get our English word dynamite. So it's the, the illustration is this, this is explosive power that God wants to bless his church with. And it's, and it's connected with the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, something that the Holy Spirit does. And, and the author of Acts here, Luke, in Acts 1.8, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, You will receive power, again, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So this power comes for, with, for a purpose. The power, and, and I'll just tell you from experience, the power is fun. The power is cool. The power is exciting. It's neat. It's something that's it's, it's neat to have. But it's, it's, it, that's really not the purpose designated here in Acts 1.8. The power, the purpose of the power is to be a witness. Now, we think about witnessing. We think, knock, knock, knock. Hi, do you know Jesus? You know, we think about that kind of witnessing. But the, 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 when the manifestations, a witness is someone that saw the crime, and they sit in the courtroom, and they say, this is what I saw. And because this is what I saw, this is what I know. What's that expression, a man with a doctrine is no match for a man with an experience, or something like that? I kind of butchered that up, but, but nevertheless, when the Holy Spirit comes, and you have an experience, whoa, with God. You, I mean, all kinds of people can argue, and, oh, no, this is what the Holy Spirit does. He makes your toes tingle, or, you know, this is what the Holy Spirit does. You know, you, woo you get, you know, you, you, you do this, or whatever. You know, okay, okay, whatever. I know what I've experienced. I know what I know. I know what the Scripture says, and I know what I've experienced, and they are in agreement. So let's look at this Holy Spirit. Because the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. How do you want a greater measure of the Holy Spirit flowing in and through you today? Well, I do. Those of you that didn't raise your hand, come on, help me out here. All right, Pentecost. Let's look at Pentecost, Acts 2, 1 through 4. Pentecost, I think, was seven weeks after the resurrection, which is where you get the Pente, which is for 50 days. But, you know, 7 times 7 is 49, but anyway, who's counting? When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. 
They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Everybody say filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so who were these people that got filled with the Holy Spirit? They were believers in who? Okay, so didn't they already have the Holy Spirit? They must not have had this part of the Holy Spirit if they already had the Holy Spirit because he had to fill them. So I believe the uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit is an experience subsequent to salvation. It's not something that comes with salvation necessarily. So nevertheless, all these believers in Jesus are filled with the Holy Spirit, and there are some manifestations. Everyone know when I say the word manifestation, what I mean? There are some things that happen in time and space. Where, whoa, look at that. You know? So there's fire appearing over the people's heads, and we could talk about that for a while. But for the sake of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. Uh, they spoke in these unknown languages, and uh, they hap the languages that they, that they spoke happened to be the languages of people that were there in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost. And so they heard them speaking the praises of God in their own language. How many of you saw the Bible on the History Channel? Anybody, anybody see that? I thought that was kind of an interesting depiction of how they did Pentecost. Uh, I thought they, they were missing about 108 people, but anyway, uh, who's counting? Acts, is somebody in here a math teacher or something? I keep thinking about these math numbers. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm a math teacher and I didn't know it. Okay, Acts 10, 44 through 46. We're talking about more manifestations of the Holy Spirit. How many of you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? I want everything God has for me. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Okay, so what, what kind of manifestation do we have? What, how do we know? Let's read. The circumcised believers who had come to Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. So we see another incidence of Gentiles and for a Jew in the, in the first century, Gentiles were kind of like Ugh. you know, they were like yucky kind of, they don't know the covenants they don't know the word, you know, they're just they're just like not, almost not subhuman but you know, you know, ugh. But so when God poured out his spirit on the Gentiles and they began to speak in other tongues, the, the circumcised believers were astonished. Do you see this? I can't believe it. God has accepted these dirty dogs, man. How, did, how has he done it? How, what is wrong with God? Why did he do this? And how did they know? They knew because they saw him proclaiming the praises of God in tongues, in, in this, this language that they hadn't studied. It's fascinating. How do you think this is supernatural? Or does this just happen every day in algebra class? There's more math. You know, just have, no, this is supernatural stuff. This is cool. Acts 19.6. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And, and what happened? They spoke in tongues and prophesied. So when the Holy Spirit came on these guys at the laying on of hands... They spoke in tongues and prophesied, and there were about 12 of them in all. So how, how do people get filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, I think Jesus said it this way in the book of Luke. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. Now let me let, me, let, me let you all just chill out for a minute. If you don't want to receive this manifestation of the Holy Spirit, don't worry, it won't happen to you. You won't have to worry about it. It's not going to jump on you and make you act weird. It's not going to happen. Because you have to ask. And in, the, in the verb tense in the Greek is present participle continuous. It means to ask and keep on asking. To knock and keep on knocking. To, to seek and keep on seeking until you see this manifestation. And he talks about gifts of the Spirit. He compares earthly fathers to the heavenly father. And he says, if you ask for a, a piece of bread, would your heavenly father give you a stone? Or if you ask for a piece of fish, which I think in our vernacular would be like a quarter pounder, you know, would, would you give him a scorpion to sting him? You know? No, no. He said, you though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts of the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So if this is freaking you out and you're weirded out by this, just take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. Now, but let me tell you something. I, heard, I had people talk to me about this baptism in the Holy Spirit before I got saved, and it weirded me out a little bit. I was like, I don't think I want to talk to you anymore. You're weird, you know. 
But so then I came to Christ, and I saw things going on in church that were uh, Holy Spirit manifestations. And I was very carnal because I just came out of the world. So, like, you know, when I was at home Sunday cooking bacon and watching wrestling, there weren't any Holy Ghost manifestations going on. Are you with me? You know, it was just natural stuff. We were just eating and hanging out and, oh, body slam, yeah, and all that. So I remember sitting in church, and I would hear some people speaking in tongues, you know. And I, hmm. and I got over my weird level. I, I stopped thinking it was weird. And I started thinking, this is kind of fascinating. Because when I was a kid growing up, we didn't do that. And, uh, and I knew these people, you know, so it wasn't like it was something foreign to me. I mean, there were people I could ask questions and talk to them about it. And I became hungry because I, was, I wanted more of God. And, and as, I, as I sat in the back of the church, Pastor Cecil Barm at Bethel Assembly of God in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, he began to teach on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. He began to talk about the power that comes. And I began to think, I was sitting right back here in this section, I began to think, man, that is what I need. Now remember, I had gotten over my weird feelings about it, and I started to just kind of think, okay, and I studied the scriptures. How I many you know the Bereans studied the scriptures to see if what Paul said was true? And they had noble character. So I think I encourage you to do that. Study the scriptures. See if what I'm telling you is the truth. I mean, I've, I've shared it very briefly with you this morning, but to me it's a, it's a slam dunk case. Bam! The Holy Spirit is something for the believer today. And when the Holy Spirit comes in power on a person's life, they speak in tongues. Or they speak in tongues and prophesy. Or they speak in tongues and do some other stuff. But the tongues is always there. Now, you think, Pastor Tony, man, are you on a tongues crusade? Well, not really. But I'm, I'm on a Bible crusade. I want, I want what God wants. And I know if people have power, they will do things differently. Now, Jesus said, uh, uh, you know... Uh, He's going to build the church. And, and, I, and I'm good with wisdom. I'm good with administration. I, I mean, those things are fine. It's, some of those things are gifts from God. But I really think we won't have a parking place or a place to sit when the church of Jesus Christ becomes what she's destined to become. And I believe how it starts, it starts with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and we speak in other tongues as, as, a, as, the, as the sign, if you will, that that's what happened. That's how these guys understood it in the Bible. When they spoke in tongues, they understood, hey, those dirty dog Gentiles just got filled with the Holy Ghost. Wow! So when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, that's what we do. Now, does, what does that mean? Well, there's, you know, again, we don't have time to get into all the ramifications. But this morning, I want to open the altar, and I want to pray with you. And uh, I want uh, some of the people, I want Miss Shirley, I want Charles, Donna, uh, you're going to sing, so you can't come up. But uh, uh, I want some of you to, that are filled with the Holy Spirit, you guys, Becky and Ken, you want to come up? And uh, anyone else, if I didn't mention your name, don't be offended. If you want to come up and pray, come up and pray. But I want to open these altars this morning. We're going to do a song. And if, if I ask you to come, just come on up right now, because I want to pray over you and uh, just touch you and, and minister to you, and then I'm going to uh, release you to pray. But I believe God wants us filled with the Spirit. And, uh, again, it's just, uh, it's biblical. Amen? And really, if I was writing the Bible, I wouldn't come up with this kind of thing. You know, I'd be like, you know, I'd have a different idea. But it's the Lord. Amen? All right. Hey, let's stretch, stretch your hands this way. You guys hold hands, will you? And uh, I'm going to pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for these four. Lord, I thank you. I bless them. I thank you for their ministry. And Lord, I thank you for their ability to lead people to baptism in the Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask you to just bless them, touch them, empower them, equip them to be sensitive to your spirit and to respond to your voice and do uh, what you've called them to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I want the worship team to come back on the stage. And I want you guys to face that way and kind of spread out. And I want to make these...